Okay, w welcome everybody. Maybe we could uh, close the door so you don't have the noise from the outside. Um, welcome, I'm glad to have such a good turnout for the uh, one of the initial um, meetings of this year's Horasis. Uh, for those of you who are here at a Horasis conference for the first time, uh, I can tell you it's always interesting who you meet in the hallway. You never expect uh, the, the different kinds of people that come, and you can never anticipate what is going to be discussed in these rooms, too. So I think you'll find that we can have a very open discussion. People can ask any question that you like. Somebody said, there's no question too stupid. Uh, I said, no, and there's no, no, no question is a stupid question. So uh, we'll hopefully we'll do that. Um, we are missing one of our um, panelists. I'll have to apologize for Brad Lalonde. He was one of the founders of Citibank in Vietnam many years ago and does have some good stories, but um, I know those stories too. I can share them with you if you like. So um, hopefully he'll, he'll come soon. But in any case, we have a great panel. Um, let me introduce them briefly, and then I will um, let them introduce themselves in terms of their perspective on Vietnam. The only only chance I have is with this mic. If if I speak closer to the mic, is that that better? Okay, it's just a bit tight in the back there. Okay, hold on, just let me get that. Okay, that's good. That do? It's great. We can be like at a soccer game or something. It's <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Uh, well, let me introduce the the panel first. Um, just. Uh, I, uh, my name is Fred, Fred Burke. I'm uh, the managing partner for a law firm of Baker McKenzie in Vietnam. I arrived here in 1991 uh, and after having spent most of the 1980s in China, working in China. And so I came to Vietnam and I never looked back at China. People said, why did you go to Vietnam after China? China's so big and important. But I love Vietnam and it's been a great decision to stay here all these years. And I think uh, after you'll hear from our panel today, um, some of the best of Vietnam is yet to come. So uh, those of you who are looking to Vietnam in the future can hear about some of our, our uh, aspirations and hopes for that. So with that, let me introduce our, our panel. Um, first we have Bill, Bill Nguyen, who's the founder and CEO of the ABS Institute. He's uh, mainly in a HR and training, a lot of online training. Um, we'll have him introduce uh, his business a little bit in a minute. Um, Mayan, um, so in the uh, IMT Solutions, he's a co-founder and president. Uh, he'll give us his perspective from the um, digital economy space, um, very important in Vietnam today. Uh, we've also got Aosang Shukla, co-founder and CEO of CapHive, um, uh, a health company doing, uh, whoops, no. Uh, anyway, you'll, you'll give us a brief uh, in a minute. Okay, so that's what we have uh, to work with right now. So each of them will give a little bit of a, um, presentation from their perspective on Vietnam and its prospects. Uh, Vietnam, uh, by all accounts, has very good prospects. If you look at the Economist magazine this week, there's a very uh, flattering uh, article about Vietnam. The Economist doesn't talk about Vietnam very often, so it, when it devotes a full page to Vietnam, you know something is happening. So um, I recommend that article to you, but a lot of uh, detailed and even more insightful uh, information should be shared by our, our speakers. So with that, um, why don't we start with, with Bill. Bill, you want to tell us about your business and about your perspective? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Nguyen, founder and CEO of ABS Institute. Um, in my opinion, the dynamic of Vietnam, as we see that the government control inflation and stabilize economies. So, it's more opportunity for investors come to Vietnam, but investment, especially Bình Dương. And that we see China go with zero COVID-19. So no production there, production in China very low. Vietnam now open market as normal before COVID-19. So much production here very good. And I could offer online courses and e-learning services that help you to develop your HR capital, to train your employee anytime, any place in the world. Thank you. Say something about um, the 
the target audience for your online learning in Vietnam? What kind of people are you are you seeking to to, um, to get involved? My target audience is uh, top rate uh, companies at uh, uh, the size of company three hundred person to five hundred, and maybe also SMB in Vietnam that help them to uh, develop their HR capital because HR capital is very important. Who can make money your firms and make profit your firm? That your HR capital, not your product. Your HR capital produce product and services can make money and make profit your for your firm in the present and also in the future. Thank you. In the uh, Economist article that I just mentioned, the last paragraph says that HR is the key to Vietnam's future. Everything else is in place, but it's all a matter of whether we can train people fast enough for the jobs of this new century um, to, to take advantage of the opportunities. So that's a, a key industry to be a part of. It's great. We'll come back to you uh, in a minute with, with uh, more questions about that. Mayan, how about you about the digital economy and its transformation? Anything you'd like to say by way of introduction? Hello? Yeah, it's working. Hello, everyone. My name is Anne Mai. Uh, I'm basically in the, working in the IT industry for over 20 years. Uh, we're providing the uh, IT services and also the digital transformation uh, for customers across the world. Uh, from, um, among all those client partners, we're working quite a lot with Indian uh, friends. And so today, I hope that I can uh, provide with all of you, uh, some of the insights about the relationship between Vietnam and India and how we can you know, basically collaborate so that we can uh, you know, um, uh, attract uh, and, and go to some of the bigger market uh, together. That's one thing. Second thing is that in Vietnam, uh, like uh, Fred and Bill just mentioned, uh, one of the greatest things is that the large pool of talent. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of people here in Vietnam and then the uh, uh, education system uh, working very well. The uh, interesting thing point is that Viet a lot of people in Vietnam can speak like Japanese, Chinese, so basically all the language of Asian country, which is something that uh, Indian company, uh, uh, in fact, needed, right? So uh, I think this is con uh, another interesting point so uh, we can uh, share more uh, about the collaboration uh, opportunity. Um, last but not least, um, I'm, I founded and run uh, AMT Solutions in uh, 2008. And uh, uh, we have office in Vietnam, of course, but we do also have office in Singapore, Japan. And uh, um, basically, uh, we do provide the uh, digital transformation uh, services uh, for the clients uh, across the globe. Right. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asang Shukla. Uh, uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Cathay, which is the technology platform for private capital markets. Uh, prior to, uh, this is a relatively new company, and before that, uh, I've been an investment banker for 20 years. Uh, focus a lot on the Indian market, but I've spent a significant part of my time uh, uh, in Southeast Asia as well. So, you know, it's been interesting to see how capital flows have uh, been growing. It's obviously been very interesting to see from the outside the growth of Vietnam. Uh, you know, it's always kind of been interesting, but perhaps. You know, maybe if I even go back five, seven, eight years ago, it used to be in conversations, you know, very low down the list when we'd go talk to investors, be it financial or strategic, uh, that, you know, yeah, it's interesting, but is it, you know, uh, each country in Asia, uh, and, you know, Fred will, of course, have lots of stories on them, but, you know, particularly, I think, in Asia, it's complex. We really got to roll up your sleeves. So the question for people used to be, you know, yes, is it worth rolling up the sleeves and spending so much time on, you know, What's a very, it's an interesting but such a small market. But how, how Vietnam has grown, it's outstanding. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone kind of, uh, you know, I speak to, it's very interesting. Suddenly, you know, it's uh, Vietnam and Indonesia when it comes to Southeast Asia becomes very active. And, you know, Vietnam in particular uh, uh, is getting, so I think it's, a, it's an interesting time. Uh, I, re I remember um, t 20 years ago, yeah. a client of mine said, Vietnam, and this goes to your point about it being a small market, he said, Vietnam accounts for 1% of my sales and 99% of my headaches. 
but nowadays it's different. Uh, things are more streamlined, especially here in industrial zones like the Becamex area. Um, and things have gotten easier, although there's still red tape and, and that kind of thing. Um, from your perspective, as you know, on the Indian side, what, what are the main changes that have happened to stimulate this interest that we now see in Vietnam? So, uh, if you allow me, Fred, maybe just a completely slightly offbeat story. So, I grew up in Delhi, um, and you know, so uh, Delhi is a very large city. Uh, you know, there are these two very large roads, you know, the, which is what was called the Inner Ring Road. Uh, it's named, you know, of course, after Mahatma Gandhi, everything in, in, in India rightfully is. And then there was a second arterial road which kind of runs kind of around, which, you know, we used to call an outer ring road. And that was named after a gentleman called Ho Chi Minh. Uh, as a young kid, uh, you know, as, you know, because we, we used to seeing, you know, uh, our roads and stuff named after, you know, freedom fighters in India. And when I was kind of old enough to go onto one of the big roads and say, you know, uh, who, who's Ho Chi Minh? Right, and uh, for me, at least as a as a young child, that was first introduction to Vietnam. But I ha I think I guess that's perhaps reflective of the deep cultural ties, and uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of Asia everywhere I've been is you know big on relationships. Uh, so I think maybe somewhere you know at least starting from you know cultural political relationships between you know India and Vietnam, and uh, you know one would have thought you know. You know, it's not a country we need to please, right? I mean, that's how political relationships are always. It's, and this is going back, you know, gone many, many years. I wouldn't tell you how many, otherwise you know how old I am. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, so e even then, right? It's, uh, you know, so I think that, I think somewhere it starts. And over the last, uh, I think, few years in particular, at least, you know, if I'll just kind of maybe talk about one part on the India-Vietnam India, China, India -Vietnam relationships, I think there's been a big step up uh, in the uh, in the news in India on the strategic dialogue, you know, so there's been this uh, uh, Mekong Ganga partnership, uh, the you know the the uh, you know the visit by the Prime Minister of India, uh, you know, many kind of uh, bilateral senior level dele delegations, and if you we kind of just you know, eventually, uh, you know, uh, by training, I'm a banker, so let's look at the numbers, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the the bilateral trade was about 200 million dollars. It's not. It's now about close to fifteen billion dollars, growing at twenty-seven percent year on year. Uh, you know, I think both countries count each other as top fifteen partners for themselves. So there is obviously something which is interesting going on, and it perhaps it's to do with a. At the end of the day, they're both countries which need to expand from, uh, out of middle income onto higher income. We both want aspire to get to you know over the next five, seven, ten years, depending on who you ask. To you know a five digit uh, dollar per capita income on a real basis. You aspire to get into high technology, manufacturing high technology and not just services kind of thing in India or manufacturing, you know, not, Vietnam has been great for manufacturing, but you need, really you need to get into the front and center into the, onto the big boys table now, which, you know, of course the big boys will, you know, always edge you out. And it's, I don't think it's going to happen from the way some of our Asian peers did it 20 years ago because that ship has sailed. Uh, so uh, is uh, may maybe one option is that you, well, you know, we, we, you know every, everyone's talking about how we get into new technologies, manufacturing, but it's not easy. HR, technology, capital, and uh, uh, I think at least it, uh, you know, both in the business and in the political circles in India, there is acceptance that it's best to go through partnerships. And uh, so I think there is, there is a, a positive bias and uh, the uh, political s uh, stability, the, you know, I think a good stable economic policy that Vietnam has shown has been interesting. Uh, you know, at least like if I go back to India, you know, all of that translated with a very strong focus on capital and we see that for Vietnam, but you know, the capital flows into Vietnam are still, you know, relatively low. Between India and Vietnam, very, very low. Uh, and I think if, you know, if there are, you know, more dialogues like these to expand them, I, I think that will surely go a long way in uh, building this. My uh, perception is that um, there, there's always been a very large representation of Indians uh, in the managerial class in Vietnam. Uh, ever since the early 90s, when the MNCs started to establish their subsidiaries here, their joint ventures in some cases, They've hired Indian managers, 
and, um, or even in some cases like Pepsi, they sent a guy to India to learn at their factory there and come back. And in both, both situations, it's really transferred a lot of know-how uh, to Vietnam over a pretty short period of time. And now, the additional benefit of that is you've got all these guys out there, and women too, who understand how Vietnam works, they've, they've managed the Vietnam pro profit and loss statement, and they you know, want to start new businesses. So for maybe it was Masan Foods, one of the biggest listed companies in Vietnam, an Indian CEO, now he's off doing uh, great stuff on his own, solar panel installation and, and things that are really useful uh, now. So it seems to me there is a special relationship. Um, it used to be that uh, there was Indians and some Filipinos in that managerial class, um, and there are some still, but it's really, uh, it's impressive, uh, I gotta say, the a number of, of Indian managers uh, that you meet, meet today who understand Vietnam and are, are do, doing very well here. Um, and then the, you know, they will facilitate that future investment that you're talking about, so that's good. Um, you mentioned capital, though. Um, everybody, you know, capital is always, the, is always a challenge. So for Indian entrepreneurs coming to Vietnam, what would you say uh, is the solution or answer to the, the question about where they can raise money? So I think uh, two or three, because, uh, uh, from an Indian perspective, you know, it's not that in, in, in general India itself is a capital starved country, uh, but uh, uh, if you split it out, I think again in the last, you know, five, seven, ten years, with a lot of wealth being created, particularly in the technology sector and also in a lot of specialty manufacturing sector, uh, you know, we've seen a large amount of capital raising within India, both uh, from an institutional perspective, family office, so these are both kind of financial pools, and then of course, the strategic capital. And that has, you know, in terms of outbound investments from India, it's really been significant about, uh, I think over the last, yeah, decade and a half, it's always been about the large Indian conglomerates going out and uh, setting up strategic capital in India, which were generally the manufacturers and the resource heavy. Uh, in the last five, seven years, you know, it's about uh, some of the Indian technology companies and, you know, Mayan, uh, you know, was mentioning to me about how some of the large Indian company, uh, tech companies are starting to kind of set up base in India. And, you know, he's already alluded to some of the reasons. So, you know, so strategic capital and financial. So if we split that out, I think from a strategic perspective, it's perhaps, you know, the biggest uh, importance is that, you know, can, is there going to be political protection for them? You know, there's not going to be policies which, uh, which kind of pull the rug under their feet. Uh, that's one. And uh, 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 that I think at least is starting to show positivity. Uh, but if there is more specific areas, right, you know, so technology, manu te te manufacturing technology, uh, you know, you mentioned about HR in the, in the econo Economist uh, article. Uh, you know, India's got a great bit of thing, uh, investment and, uh, you know, senior, ed you know, technical education. Um, I think, and, you know, they all want to expand. Uh, I think that's kind of a fairly interesting area for collaboration for both. Uh, and, and the second part, which is, I think, not been spent enough time, perhaps, is financial capital. Uh, because, again, I think you need patient, I think uh, one of the good things India did was they opened up doors for capital but made sure it's patient long-term capital and you know there are a lot of restrictions on short-term uh, short capital which because that can cause a lot of volatility. Uh, uh, so you know I think uh, the Indian capital can be fairly positive. Uh, I don't think there is enough understanding uh, yet about that. So I think you know perhaps forums like these and more to build that and attract opportunities to naturally partner. And I think once capital comes in, uh, along with it always comes, you know, more managerial, more strategic relationships. Uh, and that, I think that can set off a very nice positive uh, uh, path. Uh, so far in this next stage of development, it was originally the Bam Bangalore and Saigon were, were evolving separately from each other and software engineers didn't go back and forth. And pretty soon some India managers came and some Vietnamese go over there. The equity seems to be mostly coming this way in terms of investment. But do you also see possibility of Vietnamese companies um, investing in, in, in assets in, in Bangalore? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, but uh, you know, w would actually kind of maybe I, I would actually kind of ask Mayan for yeah, his views yeah, on that. Yeah. That's, let's let's ask Mayan about that. I mean, um, in addition to that, and whether you know, what's the 
prognosis for the deepening of the relationship between the tech sector in Vietnam, especially software development, which is such a big thing, um, but also just generally in terms of the regulatory environment. You've got in Vietnam the cybersecurity law, you've got data privacy laws, you've got the you know, e-commerce law. They're all going at different speeds with different ministries and can be quite confusing. Um, and it goes to the point that, um, that I think said before, we need uh, transparency as an investor, you need predictability. So, um, w you know, how does that translate into how the government is handling the IT sector today? Yeah, interesting. Uh, one of the things I, we learned that, you know, so far until now, the investment from India to Vietnam just about less than one billion US dollars. And the mutual trade total is about 13 billion over, a, a little bit over 13 billion US dollars last year. That means still very little, right? The potential is still there. So the way I look at that, you know, Vietnam, of course, it's a good market, hundred millions of people, it's a good market. And we, if we look at the IT uh, industry, the government here in Vietnam pushing for the smart government, you know, uh, smart cities, uh, digital transformation. Digital transformation has become like strategic plan for the country, as we all know, right? So it's a market. So that's one, one thing. And then we mentioned about the law, of course, it's a cyber security law, you know, even uh, IT protection law, and those things being done, some get done, uh, but still, I would say that because of industry, everything is in the early stage. So also same with the law and legal system. Yeah, but that means opportunity for early company. If you come early enough, then you can win a big market share. You know, it's not like tough like we earlier before the session we talk about the U.S. market, right? It's, it's, it's big, but it's all established and the competitiveness there is huge, right? So how do you compete? If you choose, like an Indian company, you choose to compete in the U.S. Uh, very high competition, or you go to Vietnam, less competition, even though things are a little bit, you know, not very clear, but you can work it out if you find the right partner. You know, of, of course, uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that I mentioned earlier uh, that the talent pool here is huge. That means Indian company can also use the talents in Vietnam you know, for some of the, uh, I would say, some of the specific, uh, some of the niche area. For example, if you want to serve the Japanese market, you know, that could be a good collaboration between Indian company and Vietnamese company. Uh, or some of the company like STL already here in Vietnam and set up their operation. So that means they're coming, right? That's another thing. The second thing is that not only um, that, but if we look at some of the very specific industry in Vietnam, for example, like FinTech. This is, we have like, uh, you know, more and more and other happening. It's a huge uh, company here. So that means also the market is here. Um, on the bank, uh, security, uh, insurance, they, you know, pushing forward with the DT, digital transformation is very hard. That means, uh, you know, opportunity. I know that some of the bank here using the IT solution from, uh, from Wipro, from Indian company. So that means it's happening. So um, Vietnam could be, as I mentioned, could be a good place to be a partner, your friend, but also can be a market. And then the way I look, would look at it is that if you look at the Southeast Asia area, we have Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Singapore. You know, in the past, pe people looking at Singapore as a place, as a hub, so that you can, through Singapore, you enter the whole Southeast Asian market. But uh, as of today, I think that a lot of people think uh, a little bit differently. They can consider Vietnam as a hub. Right? So that through Vietnam, you can enter uh, and expand to like, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, for example. So that could be another thing that like food for thought right, for, for you guys to think about that. Um, so yeah. now back a little bit on the government side. Yeah. So the government, we realize the government realized that the original manufacturing industry is good that like textile, right? It's already happening. Right? If you look at the uh, Baker uh, V6, uh, you know, on the Easter zone around this city, it's already there. But it's the yesterday thing, or could be something today, but it won't be tomorrow. Tomorrow would be smart city, you know, AI and uh, um, uh, machine learning, automotive, two things, right? So the government pushing toward that, um, I see we have a few clients who actually is doing like uh, uh, using our QC service in high form, because why? Some of the uh, manufacturing serving the electronics and also the automotive, they move from China to Vietnam 
based around Haiphong area where Vin, VinFast is, right? So they need the uh, quality control services from us, but that means it's exchange that, uh, you know, the, the government support and the, the market also pushing the wall. Vietnam is becoming, uh, emerging as a place to doing like a high-tech thing. Yeah, so that could be another opportunity. And government do realize in Vietnam, one other thing I would like that, uh, we've been uh, a member of AmCham, NorCham, you know, the government do actually listen to do uh, the size, you know, on those new leaders. And, you know, that could be something interesting, but like during the COVID time, right, a lot of feedback from us getting through those AmCham, NorCham, and then uh, got listened by the government, and they did take action. That's a good thing. This is a, a very important distinguishing feature about Vietnam, the extent to which um, they do listen to the business community, and there are certain channels that we've established over the years to have those conversations. Um, during COVID, it was remarkable. Every day there was a, uh, a town hall where their local provincial governments and business communities were exchanging their ideas on what to do from their home countries, and, 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 and the government here was very pragmatic and responsive, saying, okay, we'll try that, um, we'll try this. We, one, one thing they tried was having the soldiers from the army do your shopping for you. And then they figured out the soldiers really weren't very good shoppers, and, and they abandoned that within two weeks. That was very quick. Okay, let's try it. Didn't work. Forget about it. Move on. And that kind of pragmatism, I think, really helped them achieve um, remarkable results. When the U.S. was approaching a million deaths from COVID, Vietnam had 45. So it was it was really a, a, a you know a, a benefit. They really showed themselves uh, you know in, in a good light that time. Going to the transparency point, and uh, again, the role of these business groups, um, just on Saturday morning, we had a four-hour meeting with the Prime Minister, um, both in the room and, and 80 people online. And the business groups got to come up and ask their questions. There's a, there's a, a sort of a federation of business associations called the Vietnam Business Forum, and the VBF representatives um, you know, got to uh, bend the uh, Prime Minister's ear for a, a few hours, and then he bent their ear in return for a few hours, but when he did, he, he, he promised um, transparency, he promised uh, reduction of red tape and more facilitation of, of business license issuance. Um, but we, you know, over the 20 years, 30 years I've been here, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a constant cycle of, you know, sometimes we call whack-a-mole, you get, uh, you get a, a, a regulation that's kind of cumbersome and you deal with it and, the, and you make proposals to the government for how to do it better or more efficiently or, or just differently and um, they respond, but by the time you get that one sorted out, a new one comes up. But that's just part of economic development. Um, that you know, just goes with the territory of a country that is developing quickly. And I do think a, a lot of areas that are important to all of you in this room, such as business licensing, such as uh, uh, arbitration, these are things where they've come a long way in instituting uh, uh, you know, good institutions and um, things that can protect investors' interests. So that's, that's really the good story. Um, one of the other good stories is about green. Um, the, you know, in the, in the target markets, Vietnam, um, the consumers in those markets don't want to destroy the planet by the wearing Nike tennis shoes that are made in, uh, you know, a carbon unfriendly environment. They would like to see that, you know, everything they buy is made with reduced carbon and in a more uh, green, renewable, and sustainable supply chain. And that's really hit Vietnam. Vietnam has taken that on board. Five years ago, we had virtually no solar energy in Vietnam. Now, it's just after five or six years, it's 24% of national installed capacity to the point where they've had to curtail purchases from some of the solar plants um, um, and, 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 uh, because they didn't have the distribution transmission capacity. So that's a huge, a huge jump from nothing to 24% in just five years. Um, you know, as a consumer, I um, jumped in there too. We built a, a solar panels on our roof and our house gives all of our, um, our energy during the day and we sell a little and we buy a little back from the city at night and it's just, a, it's been working really, really well. A lot of industrial zones um, like Beckmec, they will, you know, now starting to do, introduce, um, you can have solar panels put on the roof of your factory and they will lease it back to you so you get uh, income stream very on. There's all kinds of mechanisms that are being tried and tested. Um, the law in the
the new power development plan uh, for the next five years, power development plan eight, is not quite settled, and it's also not settled about what other new uh, resources we might use. Wind energy is going to be a big part of the mix, that's for sure, but what about geothermal? What about green hydrogen? These are still things that people are uh, discussing, and there are great opportunities in my mind, because especially if you can do things on a decentralized, local level with um, industrial zones, homes, or, or, or just a provincial level, um, you know, that, that's where things really get done in Vietnam, to my mind. The central government will, plan, uh, you know, big policy, big, big laws, but the real devil is in the details. And uh, especially with energy in the new era, we have to be, you know, more, more, um, more flexible, more agile, and that means, you know, decentralized. So that's the kind of thing we're seeing. Um, how about the people to, to do it, though? That's always the question is, you know, do we have the manpower to, to run and, and develop these companies in the new era? What are you focusing on in, in, in on the HR side and the training side? And how are you getting your students to engage if they're all over the country? And you mentioned you're doing your, your training online, so let's hear about that. Uh, Ime Abini, uh, to get the uh, people get the attention on training, online training. Usually we use uh, interactive video, uh, interactive slide, that people wa watching the uh, video lecture and then they do the wishes during watch watching the uh, video lecture, uh, read the slide. And then after the watching and do the wishes, and there's some practice or simulation that they, they, they do on that one. So do learning by doing themselves so they understand and they know will be better and save the time for them. Even, even you teach, even uh, if we do lecturing or classes, but they, they listen, they forgot. If they, they listen, they forgot. So try to, how to try to get them, get involved the best way, learning by doing that do the wishes, uh, do the simulation to get them get involved and then they understand and they do it. That's the most important. Thank you. So technically, can you give us an example of, of something that, that works that way? How to engage the mind of the student to make them sure that they react and they assimilate? Yeah. I, I, I suppose there's a uh, video lecture that the teacher uh, speak to to do the uh, uh, restaurant, cook the chef, uh, do the cooking, and then they watch it, the, uh, watching the video, right? And then we have the wish, wishes that, uh, for example, you cook the uh, chicken salad, how many pieces chicken, how you grill the chicken, and then the wishes come out, and, and then get the attention that when they wa watching the video, they ignore, but if the wish can come out, they will get attention compared to just watching the video, that's all, yeah. That interactive video, that they do the wishes during the video and then that they do the practice in the restaurant. Thank you. In the education sector, it seems like a lot of the talk is about not to just to teach the students knowledge, but how to, how to learn, how to think, right? So it's in the law, in the legal field, for example, a lot of lawyers graduate from Vietnamese law schools they spend four years memorizing rules. And by the day they graduate, those rules are out of date because we have a new cybersecurity law, we have a new data privacy law, we, everything changes so quickly. So it's not useful for them to just memorize rules that are gonna be out of date the day they graduate. They have to learn how to teach themselves, how to learn, how to see some developments in society, understand why those are driving the law in a certain way. Um, in, 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 your, um, in your systems, uh, do you have you know, some, some capacity to in, in, to encourage people to, to analyze issues and to come up with solutions and think, think for themselves. So, so in, in, my, in my system that uh, people post them back to the law, right? People watching the let video letter and also the call simulation. And then they watching, they do the visit and then that's that the knowledge. They just learn the knowledge. And both them do, do learn the skill that have the call simulation that they do the rusting at the real cost, but that simulation. And then people get skilled. You see, uh, they just learn the knowledge. Knowledge like knowledge, but uh, they, how to combine knowledge and skill, that's the question. Not easy. And then it takes too much time. 
that's the letter. It may sit down that, get them the attention to the patient. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I do think the um, whole online education industry took a, you know, had it took off like crazy during COVID because that's, everybody was online. So technology wise and culturally and a lot of reasons it, it really helped. But do you see that continuing? Um, people just abandoning the online learning to go back to the classroom or is there a balance now? You think there will be a legacy of that, that COVID time? Uh, in my opinion, even the back to school, but they also need online courses. Why? Say they try, let them watch the movie, the video lecture in the past, and they just come to the lab, raise the question to the lecturer, come back to come to the lab, just listen and play the game, or go to the Facebook or with the smartphone. And then knowledge, not, not only in one country, but they take online courses. They can learn from professors over the world. And that the HR developed, but if they just take the courses at a, a, a school uh, on site, that they cannot get knowledge from other country, from developing country, from professor over the world. And as you see now, people go back to school, right? They also take courses online because some professor they cannot come here. Uh, they want to save the time to save the cost, save the, 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 the money. That online cost is very important. And that helps the people in the developing country in rural area can take courses with the minimum fee. If they go to school, they don't have money. But with online courses, yes, that gives them the opportunity to develop themselves. And if they develop themselves, they can get promotion and can contribute to the society. The society will be better. There is no poverty and then no, there is less property. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, my kids uh, just last summer during lockdown, they took a course from Stanford University that was for free um, on, on Python uh, code writing. So. Um, you know, one of the basic uh, codes. So that was really a terrific uh, opportunity for many kids around the world. Um, do you see a lot of that kind of thing going on in, in your business? Yeah, it's happening. And the uh, interesting thing is that, you know, you know we have, we talk about COVID, uh, the bad things, but also the, the, the nice thing is that, you know, it accelerates the acceptance of the online training. And one of the things that uh, happened is that even during my company, for example, before that, we had the internship for, for, for students uh, from the university. During the COVID time, we did the internship online. That means everyone received the, uh, the assignment online, they complete it, they return it back, and we have the collaboration platform running also online so that you know, the mentor can help and support the students. So this is something uh, you know, already happened. It helps a lot because it opened the door for students across the country you know, can tap into the school or any company that has excellent program for them not limited uh, with the geography like before. This is something I think very interesting. And then, you know, Frank mentioned, we keep taking the course from, you know, Stanford, from other, you know, university that we down uh, leaving the country. Um, but what about infrastructure? I mean, this does require energy, it requires bandwidth, it requires, um, you know, and, th and that requires uh, even roads. At the end of the day, infrastructure is needed for yeah. even for an online economy. Yeah. So where, where do you, I mean, Vietnam, somebody pointed out in a seminar the other day I was in that Vietnam has never successfully completed an infrastructure project on time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> look at the metro, you look at yeah, certain metro. big highways, you know, the Long Tan Expressway, Long Tan Airport, it's delay, delay, delay. So do we see that getting better or worse or, you know? It's getting better. And then uh, what I can say that, especially in terms of the IT infrastructure, uh, the government's doing, a, I, I would say that is a very good job. Uh, Vietnam is one of the very first country in the world that using 5G technology, for example, that's one example, right? And uh, the bandwidth, uh, the national bandwidth uh, upgraded, uh, and also the international bandwidth, we have now used in the past, like four or five years ago, usually we have the, uh, the accident we call like shack, like the shack room, you know, cut the car and the cable, right? Now, it's, it happened quite frequently, now it's less and less. And even now, it, whenever it does happen, the impact is much less than before. So this is thanks to the, uh, the government investing into the infrastructure and, and technology. Um, uh, 
Doing that, I remember when I first came, it was very hard to get an analog That's telephone right. line. That's right. Almost impossible. And um, we shared one with three different companies in where my old office was. And so every time you picked up the phone, it was like, it's for me, hang up. <laughs> Didn't want you them listening in on here. <laughs> yeah. And it cost a fortune, too. I mean, to send a, you know, pa a fax from the Army guest house in Hanoi was $17 a page. It was the same from the floating hotel here. So things changed a lot very quickly when digital uh, telephony was introduced. It just basically you know, skipped the whole analog era. And so that, that's a good sort of model for a lot of different things, where Vietnam does not, it doesn't hesitate to just jump ahead. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's a con you know, really first rate. Very, very, very right on uh, Brad. I think you see things reverse, right? When you came here first time, yeah. it's a very, you see very few people using a smartphone, a sm mobile phone, right? Uh, now I think probably you cannot see anyone without a smartphone. Yeah. In those days, I think all of Ho Chi Minh City had five fax machines, too. So that's, that's <laughs> they, were, they were all uh, making two copies, one for the police, one for the, the recipient. It was, uh, it was quite interesting. Um, but things, like I say, things change. Now you can use your mobile phone on an island off of Gondau when you're snorkeling and you go and you know, call the office to make sure everything is going okay. You can have quite a civilized lifestyle that way. Um, so uh, maybe what we should do uh, now is give um, you all in the audience uh, a chance to ask questions. Uh, I hope that um, you've been thinking of some, um, um, and I'm sure you have some. So don't be shy. If, if we have a, maybe if we have a microphone, somebody raise their hand who wants to um, make a question, then we could pass the microphone to you. Do we have a mic yet? Okay, we have a mic. Do we have a question? <laughs> we have to put the mic together with a question. There we go. Okay, great. Good afternoon. So, awesome Shukla uh, gave the anecdote of about Ho Chi Minh this drive in Delhi. But there's an even more interesting anecdote from Calcutta. So in the 70s, knowing the political situation that was there between Vietnam and USA, the communist government of that state renamed the street that, was, that had the US embassy as Ho Chi Minh Sarari, Ho Chi Minh Street. So the American embassy till today in Calcutta is on Ho Chi Minh Street. I just wanted to share that anecdote. I don't have a question. That's good. I mean, as an American, um, you know, too, this Ho Chi Minh is not a, not a bad name. Um, in, in University of California at Berkeley, um, I come from San Francisco, there is a, a, a trail through a park up to the physics department at the top of the hill. And during the 70s, there were so many Asian students going up to the physics department, they excelled at physics, uh, that they called the trail the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So <laughs> It's a recognition of, you know, not just Vietnam, also other Asian, but they were doing so well in, in maths and sciences, and that's still the case. So, yeah. So it looks like you had that in your consciousness a long time. Does, does, the, does the Vietnam that you experience as you come here match your expectations from having that idea a long time ago? Sixteen years. And from the airport, when you drive through, my colleague uh, Vijay and friend, we were bo we are both from Bangalore. Uh, the uncanny resemblance of the street side to Indian cities, it is, but for the language, it's almost the same. The way the shops are, the kind of things that are sold, the way people are so socializing, the demography looks absolutely the same. Clo it is closest to the city of Calcutta. Uh, if you drive through the city of Calcutta at night, that's how the drive from the airport looks like. A lot has changed in the 16 years, especially on the talent, and I'll give you an example. In Jakarta, I come from Jakarta, Indonesia. I run a skilling company there, and we work with the government to skill, digitally skill up teachers and students, etc. We always speak about the lack of tech talent, and the comparison is to India and Vietnam. And everybody is complaining that Indian tech talent is now more expensive than the one in US, and the Vietnamese tech talent prices are going up because the Indians are charging higher, because they always peg themselves to the Indians. So it's, it's a comparison, and I think just being spoken in the same breath as a comparison is a huge compliment to where Vietnamese talent has gone in the last 10, 15 years in the tech side. Sure, I think, I mean, every, every place in the world, almost, is developing somewhat. You know, I go back to San Francisco, and I think, wow, there's some new things, new technologies. But, but Vietnam seems to be going 
you know, as fast as you can possibly go uh, in this era. One of the things I think that's helped Vietnam, if you compare a lot of other countries in the region, and that is openness of the government to services participation. So accounting, law, construction, design, marketing, um, you know, consulting, all these things are open to foreign investment. And that means that you know, it, it, Vietnamese companies that want to deal with foreigners, they have those resources at hand. And to my mind, compared to Philippines or some other countries that were very, very um, strict on, on allowing foreign investors to set up services, uh, you know, it's, it, Vietnam has a big advantage and it's really helped, helped stimulate things here. I mean, obviously the other part is, the, you know, the boat people, a million, two million people went out of the country to US, Australia, France after the war, and they learned, you know, a lot, and they brought it back. Um, and now, you know, what they brought back has built fortunes, um, the first unicorns or um, people like that. So, um, you know, that's another advantage. Um, in the beginning, oh, people like that were afraid to come back to Vietnam. They thought the government was gonna, you know, put them in jail because they supported the wrong government during the war. But, you know, the government consistently takes this view that the past is the past, and we're looking to the future, and uh, very, very pragmatic that way. It's, it's a good thing. Um, Anything you'd like to say on, on that one? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, we have another question uh, about there. You guys can jump in too if you, if you have any. Okay, please. I'm Vijay Sambamurthy and uh, I'm a corporate lawyer like you, Greg. And I live in Singapore, but uh, I run a firm called Lexi Group, which does a lot of corporate advisory work in M&A private equity in venture capital. So I agree with all the points Nalin made about similarity, except one thing is everybody was driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> driving on the wrong side of the road. But uh, my question is more around a couple of uh, points that you made is, uh, I mean, it's a fascinating discussion around similarities or uh, synergies between the two countries and I couldn't agree more with most of the points. Uh, one of the points that you made was about how the whole telecom system leapfrogged. I think we saw the same thing happening in India. You couldn't get, uh, you know, a landline unless you, you know, moved all the wheels of government to try to know somebody and pay extra. But today we are in a situation where everybody has smartphones, everybody has 5G, everybody has, you know, uh, access. Uh, and most of the payments are done through phones these days. Nobody takes cash. So it's gone to the you know other extreme by leapfrogging and I'm uh, seeing the same thing happening here. But one thing uh, which I'm curious to know about is how are the efforts taken by government and the industry here to develop a healthy startup and venture capital ecosystem? Because I think in India, one of the biggest game changers was the fact that there was investment made by the government and by the startup community and by the you know VC community to develop a local ecosystem. So when I started my career about you know 25 plus years ago, m almost all the money came in from foreign VCs. There was you know it was one or two Indian VCs. Now there's a very very strong Indian VC ecosystem, which is supporting a very very strong. Uh, domestic startup ecosystem. So I'd love to get the panel's views on some of this. Thank you. Good question. Uh, because, you know, one of the things that came up during the meeting with the Prime Minister on Saturday was the fact that despite efforts at in enabling legislation for pu public-private partnerships, we have not had a single uh, real PPP here, if you really think about, you know, your traditional definition of PPP. So, um, you know, it's really not relied too much on the government, except in, say, planning terms in joint venture with private sector. So Beckhamex is probably a good example of that. The way they've planned the community around here, infrastructure has been done on time. You know, they've got the industrial zones pretty much squared away. So that's a, there's, there's examples of that right up and down the coast, all the way to Bac Ninh uh, up in the north. Um, so, so Vietnam does do that, where the government gets involved on the planning side, but they don't have the capital to really, you know, seed seed a lot of this. So, for example, the you know the airport and the the metro. A lot of these are, are money issues because they the cost overruns and they don't have the money. You know, the World Bank and the other donors are tired of you know financing cost overruns, so the projects get delayed, delayed, delayed. That that's 
you know, Vietnam's really good when it comes to entrepreneurial activity and, you know, when, when the government's not interfering. But as soon as it does, then sometimes, you know, things can, can get slowed down and go, go wrong. Um, what would you say about that? And I think it's, it's easier in the IT sector, don't you think? Yeah. You know, like but that's a change from the two sectors that you're describing. Sure. And I'm not sure that's the case. Sure. The, um, uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, I do, I do, yeah, as Brett mentioned, the government uh, don't have a lot of money to, to kind of like, uh, you know, put it as a, you know, to push things forward at the first, but they do provide some of the, uh, you know, legal framework. Also, there are some funds from the government, you know, just a little money, but it also help with uh, some uh, uh, entrepreneur who can start something. So those run under some of the, uh, the uh, uh, venture fund that funded by the government as well. So th we do have some of that, but uh, I think the way we see is that we need more VC from overseas coming in, you know, and, and use that money as a main uh, accelerator. The, um, we see that, you know, it's a, at least in the, from a high-tech perspective, we have a few unicorns. Momo, we want one of that, like SoftBank investors, so that's uh, you know, over a billion, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, DNG, things like that. So those are a good story to tell and attract people. And then you know, you, if you recall back a few years, uh, Misfits is another company founded by American Vietnamese coming back and then, you know, sold it to Fossil. Right? A billion. Yes, sir. So it's not a successful story uh, on this one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the, the um, what we can uh, what we can say is that the uh, government, the way they look at us, they don't give you direct money. Uh, you know, we have subsidiary in Singapore. Um, go Singapore and government give a lot of money, free money to the small startup, uh, even in Malaysia as well through MDEC, right? So, but in Vietnam, we don't have that kind of similar thing. At least at that equal, but. You know, the government will let you do the thing. Uh, they don't work, you know, like Brett mentioned, they won't, they won't interfere if you just, you know, want to do it. And they do listen whenever you want to uh, make some suggestion on the legal change, things like that. We have like IT association, we have you know, Amcham, Norcham, on that uh, association. Uh, it's, a, it's a channel that we have created and then give the feedback back to the government so that they can uh, fix the thing. Like one of the things we mentioned during the fintech uh, a few years ago is that the sandbox mechanism. Right? So we talk about that, they, they do listen, they, they, they are taking some action on that one as well. So I think that's always good because sometimes government not doing anything is the best contribution they can make. <laughs> but I think the question is, you know, how, uh, you know, and, you know, and I think maybe that's something to be mindful. We've also seen that in India, but you know, you know, as much as we stay away, when so much money comes in and so people get successful and there are always a few kind of rotten apples here and there, but you know, it just becomes too difficult for them to keep their hands out of it. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's hopefully, uh, but you know, so if the Vietnam is, the government's been largely staying away, that's yeah. very, very good. Yeah. It's, it, Vietnam uh, is, is, a, is a sort of poster child for international trade and integrating with the global economy. A lot of the opportunities that have been created for Vietnamese entrepreneurs have been opening up markets through market access agreements, through originally the, the bilateral trade agreement with the U.S. in 2001, then getting into the WTO 2007, or recently with CPTPP, even though the U.S. didn't go through with it, Vietnam did. Now they've got um, the EU FTA, UK FTA, uh, was a, they've got RCEP, which it's a pity that uh, India actually uh, withdrew from that at the very end. That was, that's really a, a, a pity. It's almost as an American, I feel your pain because we withdrew from CPTPP. But all these things have been great for Vietnam. They do create opportunities for, for businesses here. And the government, all they had to do was put into place the legal framework. So there was first the en investment law, the enterprise law, securities law, intellectual properties law, step by step. And they took, you know, World Bank, IFC, um, you know, um, um, help uh, on each step of the way. So, you know, they bring in the lawyers from other countries and say, this is how we do it in our country. Um, they, government reached out to us one time and said, what are the, you know, 10 top principles of the securities law in all the countries that they listed? And so I just, you know, sent out a fax to the Baker McKenzie lawyers and they sent me back the 10 top principles, you know, insider trading, tender, tender requirements, all the basics of the securities law. And they put it in a pretty good securities law. And now they've got a thousand companies listed on the Vietnam Stock Exchange and it's a very active way for people to raise capital. It's a working, functioning capital market. And the governance actually is getting better too. They've got Vietnam Institute of Independent Directors because the 
new securities law requires that you have independent directors on the board of any listed company. So, you know, it, it's, it's rolling and they keep doing it and there's a professionalism about it that's quite reassuring. Now, on the other hand, there is still a lot of red tape. You know, we were joking about when I first got to Vietnam in 1991, the entire legal system for foreign investment fit in a 70-page book in both languages. So it was pretty, it's pretty skimpy, easy to get through in a day. But now we've got jungles, you know, would fill this room if you actually printed out all the laws and circulars and decrees uh, that, that, that govern business. So you do have to have lawyers who know what they're doing. Um, but the whole point about trade agreements, aggressively integrating into the global economy to create, you know, to opportunities for Vietnamese companies, and at the same time sharing it with foreign investors. You know, it's been what the Prime Minister kept saying on Saturday was, this is going to be a win-win situation. He knows he's got to market the country in a way that, you know, makes people incentivized to come. They won't come by demand, right? Yeah. So, yeah. It's very true, Fred. And then, uh, you know, from the IT uh, industry, for example, I give you one example, like uh, back to year 2000. So actually, our leadership, you know, came and visited uh, India to learn about the IT industry in India, and then the legal framework and things like that in India, so that we can improve our system. And after that, we do have the law, right? Like for IT company, you have tax incentive, you know, zero tax for first four years, etc. So those things that the government, when they really come see, they learn from it, and they will take action. So those things. But we need, you know, we do as a business sector. We have to arrange those things happening. You know, we have to arrange the visit. You know, tell them, you know, what what you should do, and then through official channel. And then when they get the information, they'll take action. Okay, so you know, don't be shy to ask tough questions. Come on, please. Yeah. Thank you. Just a comment and then a question. Um, I would argue that uh, there is uh, yet a good ecosystem and a good market for the venture capital because it uh, depends on the exit opportunities a lot. And I'm not sure that there are many exit opportunities for the Vietnamese startups. Uh, however, I think that uh, if the attention refocuses to the B2B startups, then there will be much more jobs created and also much more scale. and. Uh, uh, it will be profitable for both local and international companies importing, exporting the technologies. Uh, and uh, the related question is, could you elaborate a little bit more on how the industrial parks or economic zones uh, work in the provinces? Uh, what it takes to enter the provincial markets and uh, how uh, unanimous are the regulations and what are the tools for the foreign investors and uh, foreign entrepreneurs to come not to the center but to the regions okay lots lots there good questions both of them <laughs> maybe take the second one first because this is something that's very hot in vietnam right now is the land law there's um, some draft um, amendments to the land law um, that have been everybody's been working on for the last five years and unfortunately, they might not be what we're hoping for, so we're really um, a bit, you know, stressed and pushing back and forth on that. Um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, issues I could go into, but at least the new land law in terms of industrial parks is clear, and it's very supportive, so that, that will be a step ahead. Whether that um, translates for infrastructure, for residential, for commercial use of land, that's another story. Um, so, um, but for the, for the infrastructure parks and the industrial zones, you know, this is something Vietnam's been doing since the early 90s. Um, you know, the Tan Thuan Export Processing Zone, uh, in part of the, um, the Saigon South Development Project, was, was really a well, well thought out, um, you know, the Taiwanese came in, they knew exactly what, how to do it, and they just implemented it very well. They designed the whole Saigon South city around it, so even to the point of having proper drainage, you know, from a, on a large scale um, basis. It's the size of Singapore, that development. Um, so it, you know that that really showed so that they could do it, um, and then we had the um, high tech parks coming in, and they're still a big deal. Um, you know, Intel got good terms on their first investment, and then they put a lot more into training and development. They put in the, the 35 million extra beyond their initial investment just to top up the training so that the P the engineers that they hired were able to meet Intel standards, and they brought people to the U.S. and all that. So that's all uh, part of partly that they are in an industrial zone that, that encourages them to do things like that. And they've had that really good city management directly to them. Uh, what, uh, what hurts a lot of people investing in Vietnam is you go out to the provinces where the, 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 the technical level is not so high um, and you get m you know, bogged down in local politics. And you know, it, 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 it's not easy for, for foreign investors trying to comply with international governance principles and ESG to deal on those local levels. So an industrial park can quarantine and sort of 
know, create a safety zone for that. That's one of their big arguments in the industrial zone. So you go down, if you go out the door and down, down, down the road back to Saigon, you'll see the VSIP, the Vietnam Singapore Industrial Park. I think they've got 13 or something parks around the country now, and, and it's their own, it's a good business for them. So it's the government letting business serve business, the B2B thing that is working uh, in that. And then, you know, the tenants are happy too because they can do their export processing, they can, you know, get along with their business pretty easily. Now, now there's going to be more in the, the new law. We think there will be more requirements for housing for the, the workers because it is a problem with workers having to come too far on their motorbikes and it's, you know, there's, uh, you can see the traffic issues are so. So, yeah, anything else you guys want to add to that? Yeah? I talk too much. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned the provincial role. I think there's, a, there's always this debate about, you know, how much power should the provinces have and how much should the central government have. And, and, and my feeling has always been it's good to give the provinces a lot of authority to decide what they want as long as it's within the national framework um, because, you know, that m creates a healthy competition. So, for example, in the early days, you know, you'd, you'd have to pay some under-the-table money just to get a simple company established. And, and, and then, you know, some, some provinces um, turned out to be much cleaner and efficient than the others, and everybody r rushed to those places, you know, because you can do business in it, you know, uh, nationally from anywhere in the country. So um, that, that was, a, you know, a, a, the, the, there's something called the Provincial Competitiveness Index, which the World Bank um, instituted, and it, it ranks, all the businesses give their ranking of which provinces are the most user-friendly from a business point of view. And it's, the provinces take it very seriously, you know, they hire counsel to help them get a good score in the PCI. And uh, that's very helpful too, because, you know, it's, uh, competition can, can create good things too. So, yeah. Anything else you wanna add? Yeah, and uh, you know, like for, for us, for example, you know, we, when, uh, as a company uh, based mainly in the South Vietnam, uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, but when we consider some of the other province to uh, you know, open the branch office, for example, you know, we do meet with the uh, local government, and then we do compare, we do the comparison. You know, some of the province they really active, they listening, they you know, they will do whatever you uh, you ask for, if as long as it's making sense. You know, and some province they just you know just listen, and and that's it. Right? So so it's your choice, uh, and then uh, I think I agree that the government tried to create the. Uh, the fair competition between province and province, city and city. And then, you know, they will probably do the performance appraisal after that, but uh, uh, it does happen. Yeah. I, I actually have a question to, you know, uh, because we spoke actually about, uh, really about capital and I've just been reflecting some of the things you asked me, so I've, I'll ask you back. Now, how has been the experience for, from your, you know, because you've seen large amounts of capital from the you know, the banking regulator, the securities regulator for easing in and out capital flows and protecting them. Because I think that's kind of, you know, both, and, and you know, perhaps affiliated, and it's, I know it's a complex question, but I'll, you know, just maybe also from a tax perspective, but at a broad level, how, you know, how has been the experience, how's that, uh, you know, shaped up in the last few years? Uh, our point of view on the regulatory side, the regulatory mechanisms are in place in Vietnam to, you know, prevent a, a meltdown or, a, you know, panic or this kind of thing. They have trading ranges for the stock market and they, they can, in a, uh, you know, serious event, close the market to trading, especially, um, you know, capital inflows and outflows. However, um, in, for foreign currency regulation, um, it's really not been a problem of the regulations. It, there, it's very clear now what you can take money in and out quickly for and what you have to get approval for and what you can't take out. So originally, for example, it was not supported in the foreign exchange rules to take out winnings of gambling because gambling was illegal under the criminal code. So we, we got the first foreign investment in gaming casinos. We had to change the law. And, if, you know, the government, oh, yeah, okay, we got to change the law. So they changed the law. Um, they allowed, if you, you know, pay your tax on your gambling winnings, you can bring it out of the country and it's legal, legal gambling winnings to begin with. So that, that, that helps a lot. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, um, in, in large terms, so that, that means there's certain, you know, reasons you can take money out of the country. Education for your kids or remittance of your profit, remittance of your, um, you know, your principal and interest on your loan, um, your, your, you know, capital gains. All those are legal to take out, you guys to, but you have to show the bank that, you know, what the source of funds was um, because they don't allow just mere speculation across the board. It's not just a, a trading game. And, um, you know, there's, yeah, that, that's, that's sort of the basic picture, yeah. Anything to add? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, 
under the uh, the law regulations there. So as long as you comply with that, and you can you know move the money around, it's, it's uh, not a problem. But also they, they do control that. But it's all make very clear and transparent uh, from my perspective. But as the control is left largely to the banks, right? Yes. So the banks are the ones that check your papers. Right. So is this a legal source that can be taken out? Yeah. Um, you know, and I have seen cases um, in, in 30 years, maybe two or three times, where there was a global financial crisis or the Asian financial crisis, and, and funds were hard to get. So you have to buy, you know, if you have a lot of dong revenue, you want to convert it to dong dollars to take it out, you, that's legal, you can do that, but you have to go into the market to buy the dollars. So if your revenue is in dong, you have to factor in that foreign exchange risk. Um, fortunately, I mean, the, the currency valuation has been pretty stable over the years. So along with political stability, um, the currency stability is one of the things they can talk about. Same here, as one example I, I can share is that this is uh, maybe a, a small story, but uh, like we are an export company, so we do have US dollar, and as the law, you cannot easily take your US dollar from the bank account here. You have to sell it to the bank through the exchange rate agreed by the government. But whenever we have to go out, and like for example, send our engineer to, uh, to work overseas, then that, that time, if we have prepared all the paper needed, then we can take our US dollar, and then use uh, for that business trip purpose. Uh, we pay our money from our Vietnamese bank accounts, uh, you know, through other client and partner in the U.S., in other places of the world, no problem. As long as, you know, you comply with the regulation and law, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, questions? We still got some time, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Fred, and uh, thank you. Um, I have a one comment and then one small uh, question. You know, actually, I have uh, been uh, following the uh, <coughs> India and Vietnam partnership for about 10 years. But uh, we are not very happy with the outcome so far. You know, India is a huge economy. And, uh, but, you know, but now is the, is the uh, trading, the trade between the two countries is only around twelve billion dollars. Even it has been growing, but very small. Even India is now ranking number nine in terms of ten top uh, trading partners for Vietnam. But let's compare. You know, it's only less than one-tenth compared to the trade between Vietnam and China. Less than one-tenth. And uh, investment. Investment between Vietnam and India is very small. India has only one billion, billion dollars with about 300 projects investment into Vietnam. Ranking number 26 in terms of foreign investors into Vietnam. And only in some areas. Okay? Um, and you know, we have a lot of potential. As you talk about, we have a lot of, you know, commonalities. So, having said that, we are proposing there should be more cooperation between Vietnam and India, and in, in many, many other areas. Let me just uh, talk to you some. Now, India, uh, you know, has, India and Vietnam have become uh, what we call comprehensive strategic partners. And the Indians also have got what we call Eastern accent policy. Okay, uh, and of course, ASEAN has become a very important partner for India in India-Pacific strategy. Okay, um, so I think you know we can develop our cooperation in diplomacy. This year is our 50th anniversary, you know, between Vietnam and India, and tonight. We are uh, celebrating it over here, okay? So, and also in defense, defense security, also very important as well. Uh, number two, in terms of 
of uh, economic partnership. I think, you know, we may uh, promote our investment in some other areas. Number one, circular economy. You talk about green, you talk about digital. So circular economy should be one of the key areas where we can share experiences. Vietnam now has uh, identified that circular e economy is uh, our must, our must in the future. So how can we share our expertise uh, in this area, especially manufacturing in India and also in Vietnam play a very important role in our economy, number one. Number two, you know, India has been very, very uh, famous, you know, for, for uh, IT, okay, information technology, uh, ICT. So why not promoting in that? In finance, I would like uh, more cooperation in FinTech. In FinTech, India has been very successful, you know, in launching your mobile payment system. So Vietnam can share and can learn from you in that. In terms of, you know, uh, biology and pharmacy, we really, really wish, you know, to develop cooperation with India in biology and pharmacy. So far now, in Vietnam, we have uh, 150 pharmacy companies from India operating in Vietnam. But we do know that, you know, India has got a lot of more potential in this area. So biology and uh, pharmacy, especially, you know, after the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to develop that as well. Um, next one, climate change. We all know climate change are affecting India and Vietnam. So how can we grow together and then also develop our strategy in adapting to climate change? Vietnam really needs to have a very good strategy and policy, you know, for combating and also adapting to climate change. Okay, um, having said that, I would like to ask uh, a question. Why, you know, why, why so? Why, you know, the trading and investment, even education and training and pharmacy partnership between uh, Vietnam and India have not been so developed as we expected? So, it can be, it can be, it may be the trust. Is it? The trust. Or it could be the government support. Is there sufficient government support for businesses to develop cooperation between Vietnam and India? Okay? Because I have seen, for example, the direct flight between Vietnam and India. We talked for a long time, for 10 years, and now finally we made it. But is that enough? So I'm thinking about there should be more maybe government support from the FDI perspective and also from the you know, every business perspective. For example, when we want to develop the partnership you know, between India and Vietnam in every processing business, so it might be some kind of you know, insurance for the firms. Okay, so that's my comment and also my very short uh, question. Thank you. I mean, there's a lot of good questions in that question, actually. Um, and I hope our Indian friends will jump in to, um, to, to add to what I'm about to say because um, you know, I think it's a bit of a challenge to India to say you know, what's going on. Um, because I do think you know, it's not, you, can't, you have to manage your expectations first because we're talking about two countries that, that have a lot of commonalities but not necessarily comparative advantages. 
So it'd be you know, one thing if you could trade A for B, but you've got A and A. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily encourage you know, um, um, trade based on comparative advantage. So you have to fall back on public you know, policy and in India, being a democratic country, it's 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 slow, and it's you know it's the it's protectionist, and uh, you know all those things that slow down trade. So Vietnam, I don't think Vietnam is alone in being in having trouble, you know, meeting expectations with trade with India. I think there's a lot of countries that feel the same way as Vietnam. Like this could be much bigger, and it's up to the Indian population to vote and make that happen. But you know, failing that, it's hard to say how. Um, um, the uh, you know the I, 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 the Indo-Pacific economic framework is going to solve that. I just don't you know I think it's a humble agreement with much to be humble about. Um, you know it's uh, not going to get us there. But but nevertheless um, you know we can't give up. India is such a you know the potential is so great, uh, and Vietnam is is a country that already proves itself to be able to deal with a lot of different trading partners. Vietnam has a multilateralist foreign policy, as you know. It's trading with China and the U.S. and Japan and Australia and EU all at once and fantastic, you know, that, that's a, the whole world should be that way. <laughs> um, so it's good, but um, I don't know, anybody else have anything to say about why, why India is not meeting expectations today? So I think, uh, yes, I, I should say, the India-Vietnam trade relationship is not meeting expectations. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you made a very good point uh, that you know essentially there are a lot of similarities, but too many similarities to that extent. And you know, in a way, neither com I think, to be fair, neither country has had excess capital or you know uh, excess you know resources uh, to have kind of done that. So everyone's kind of been trying to kind of find their place. And but uh, you know, uh, and you, you know, it's interesting you made the point about the direct flight. Because you're actually talking about that uh, outside a uh, few of us, that you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, j it, these are small steps, but they kind of help get things done. Because you know, at least you know, and and there is, uh, I, I, mm, at least from my perspective and from the you know uh, the universe of people I've spoken to, uh, uh, in particular, and that is a large number of Indian investors there. I don't think there's lack of trust. There is lack of understanding. Uh, you know, and, and trust perhaps is the next step. So you know, uh, you know, let's kind of first get the understanding between India and Vietnam at a uh, you know uh, broader level. And I, do, I don't think we can expect a whole lot from either governments because they're both running around. But perhaps the best they can do is help open some doors, which at least uh, from the Indian perspective, I see some steps for that. That opening that, and you know, I think. But really, it's kind of forums like these which allow exchange of ideas, uh, you know, enable exchange of capital. And you know, let's you know they're both extremely entrepreneurial countries, really, right? And uh, hopefully they'll figure their figure their way around. But I think there is uh, one you know separate. I, th I think in the last maybe 20 years, I think foreign policy for a lot of the countries has been too focused either on U.S., China, and really I think in India you can also add Russia there somewhere. To have even looked elsewhere, it wasn't needed. And I think a lot of those boundaries have been redrawn. I think similarly, Vietnam also needs to look at perhaps in India, you know, because you have to kind of, you know, you know we're all like gradient economy, so we all realize the value perhaps of, you know, the village coming together and helping each other. So, you know, we perhaps all are a little bit of neighbors, you know, not immediate but close by. So maybe we'll ha hopefully learn from that and create more dialogue between them. I think we, I hear a bell outside. I think that is our bell, and that's a great note to end on. Um, I did mention earlier that there's this, you know, managerial class which is uh, largely populated by Indian and in Indian managers in Vietnam, and that's a great resource if we want to build trade because those guys do have the trust, they do have the knowledge, and we should mobilize that. You know, that seems to be an obvious uh, short-term solution. But um, great, great questions, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. It's nice to meet you, and um, 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 hope to see you in the uh, in the hallways. Have a very productive uh, couple of days here at Horaces. Thank you. Thank you to our panel panelists. <laughs> Very brave to get up here on the first day. <laughs> yes, please, let's do that. Yeah.